Hi everyone, nice to uh, meet you everyone here remotely. I'm here in Wisconsin. Um, so my name is Hung uh, from University of Wisconsin Madison, working with uh, Professor Mika Lepasti. So today I'm gonna um, talk to you guys about our uh, most recent work, tail wag, tail latency, workload analysis and generation. Yeah, so during this talk, I'll um, give a little bit of introduction and background about tail latency, um, the performance metrics, some of the problems and challenges, challenges we're facing, and then talk about uh, the main work tail wag, how we do the workload analysis, uh, how we do generation and validation, and after that, we uh, have a uh, case study right before conclusion. So uh, I'm pretty sure people already heard enough about uh, enough how uh, like how important are these buzzwords, um, cloud computing, data centers, supercomputers, and of course HPC. That's the um the topic. But then combining with the workload, um, uh, like machine learning, AI, and of um more traditional scientific uh calculations or web services, there are different metrics um uh being used for um evaluating a system for several workloads, um. Today, I just want to um, focus in about uh, the latency and throughput instead of the um, other things such as powers and energy. If we, um, if we uh, re uh, record uh, the main service latency from an application and transfer the distrib distribution graph into cumulative distribution, you can see, uh, so, so here I have two applications, um, one is called Shore, one is called Silo, they're running a, a certain um, load. Here, the, the main goal I'm trying to show that is uh, within the collected data, which is underlying the, the blue region, the mean latency um, and the, the gap between the mean latency and then the tail latency could, uh, could be much long, uh, could be very big. For example, the short one, the 99% tail of all the uh, service requests uh, could be uh, six times more than the mean latency. Being a, single, being a single user, um, they might think, yeah, it's fine. As long as my request is not the 99 percentile, I'll, I'll be happy. Um, but that's not, but that's not uh, the, the case in real life. Uh, in real life, uh, both mean latency and tail latency should be representative to a system performance. As I mentioned now, um, we have services scale. Um, we have multiple layers of application. Just being a single user, you thought you are sending one request to the server, but you end up by uh, using uh, multiple tiers of um uh, of nodes, and then for example, if the one uh slower latency uh slower requests are contributed to the whole request, then you have to wait for all of them to come back. The key point is to show um the tail latency uh the tail latency is more pronounced than uh, the user can uh, imagine, and and it's usually high behind the uh, the wall. Now let's talk about uh, what could uh, make a uh, tail latency goes bad and where are they coming from? So it started with me trying to figure out uh, how to improve server performance. But then um, I, one of the tricks people are using is increase the priority for a server request. But then I run to a strange problem here that I have a better uh, mean latency, which is, the, which is the green dots on the bottom. And then for the round trip, there's uh, unusual spikes that are happening every second, which is um, uh, labeled in the, the red dot. And then after, for the, for the digging, maybe days or weeks, then I figure it out because I try to uh, have a better performance using the real-time scheduler, a higher priority, uh, either five or a round, round robin. But then I omit the details that uh, Linux kernel by default only allows 95% of the CPU time can be used to this kind of task. Um, the reason is for safety. So you can't uh, uh, over push it up. You can allow other system threat to be run in the, those 5% time. Sure, um, I can just erase that and then let the system to, uh, let the server application to use all of my CPU time. But uh, it could be dangerous, and uh, um, you 
as a server provider, you don't really want the application to have this um, behavior. Furthermore, since we already talked about a server system, there are hardware interrupts uh, coming with it. So here in the figure I'm showing uh, from the left to right, I have uh, two CPUs running two server threads um, tied to it. Uh, starting from the left to right, um, both of them running happily. But then when the system, uh, when I saw uh, Ethernet interrupt coming in, like server thread one has to um, has to swap out to a contact, um, hardware contact, serving then interrupts, and then coming back. The, the issue here is usually um, uh, server third one and two that have, um, they have critical section that are sharing um, uh, global resources. Uh, server, sometimes server third two hitting the spin waiting limit just because a few more uh, microseconds happening uh, on the server thread one. Then there will be um, unwanted, undesired millisecond scale sleeping time. Uh, meanwhile, um, if I just wait longer, I can uh, get a log immediately. So here I'm just trying to show how does the microsecond scale interrupt can actually cause in the millisecond scale. Uh, and again, this only happening uh, for uh, uh, rare cases. It's not showing up in the mean latency. And then there are ways to avoid this kind of uh, um, timing disturbance. Uh, when we have a system that, for example, if we have a system that have uh, four cores, we can have one of the cores handling interrupts. Meanwhile, have um, other three server threads, uh, other threads running on three other cores, or we can use uh, all the cores running, um, you know, both interrupts and then uh, the server application. Um, uh, the server's behavior, uh, performance behavior, will be different. If we're having uh, the I denoted uh, those two with SAP and mix using um, using SAP, we will have lower latency. That's uh, what we expected since we don't have those timing disturbance uh, within the low to medium uh, load. So here, what I'm showing the X is the uh, system load from low to high, and then the Y is the uh, latency. So green line means the mean latency of all the requests. Not, uh, the uh, red line means the 99th uh, percentile. On the other hand, if I have the dotted lines uh, uh, presenting the mix where I have four server threads, uh, we expect uh, to having higher throughput, that's what you want, but you have lower 99th percentile uh, latency uh, before the threshold. That's normal. We have a um, trade-off question to, um, to ask and answer. Do we want better latency or better throughput? As you can imagine, there are uh, more than two of the cases I just mentioned um, to, to uh, tune in the system, figuring out, can we have a better latency? How does uh, this kind of uh, timing disturbance happens? To under, to trying to um, look into this question easier and understand what's going on behind it and um, extract the, uh, uh, to bring up to um, higher abstract level. That's, that's the main motivation to our work. But we're trying to, um, the tail whack, uh, tail latency, uh, workload analysis and generation. We're trying to, uh, the two part, for the analysis part, we're trying to identify the problem and challenges when you're running some application and then extract them to um, uh, using set of parameters representing the original uh, workload, and of course, there might be some tuning, and then using those, using a generated workload, we'll try to uh, do a early stage design exploration on a system that uh, might not be there. So um, I'll just talk about the introduction, some of the backgrounds, and then I give you a, a overflow uh, workflow of the system. Now I'm going to step uh, step into details, uh, talk about how do we do the analysis, generation, validation, and then case study. So first, analysis. I talk about extracting the uh, information from the system and then parameterize them. But how many uh, parameters do we need? Well, we need three. 
Um, but how do we how do we approach that? Um, let me uh, step back and talk about the um, the prior work, the uh, the application that we're using as a baseline to study, uh, which is called a uh, uh, tail bench. As um, so here I'm showing the the configuration uh, where we can have multiple client uh, connect to the server uh, over Ethernet or uh, could be local host, and then. Uh, the application uh, is, has a wide range of applications, including online searches, uh, key store, key value store, uh, image DNN, or um, Java applications. So, um, but the work we are doing here that's not limited to Tailbench. Tailbench could be applied to other workloads as well. So after um, we use the uh, we use the harness uh, from Tailbench to get the, um, the data result we want, which is uh, uh, denoted here in the red block here. And then we're trying to uh, try to analyze what kind of um, um, how do we how do we get uh, that? Yes. And then oh, sorry. Yeah, this is the uh, the baseline system we're running. So what I'm showing here is um, we're running the the original uh, tail, tail bench on uh, Ethernet connected uh, a modern uh, server and client system. Uh, we're only we're only using um, uh, one. We're not using uh, FMT. We're, we disable the deep uh, deep deep sleep state, making sure uh, there's no latency on on those behaviors. Um, so uh, from the res then we are moving to the data we collected. Um, so similarly, this is the uh, distribution distribution graph I showed um, earlier. But now uh, it's really uh, it's not that easy. It's not intuitive to see uh, what kind of distribution it is. Is it? Um, but then if we transfer that to um, a power um, a density function, uh, it's more easy to identify that. Oh yeah, it looks like a norm, um, like a Gaussian distribution or norm distribution. And then uh, in the graph, I'm, I'm show, also showing the, the mean latency, 95 percentile and 95 percentile. And the blue dot, uh, the blue curve right here, just uh, uh, showing the, the density function. Uh, but what can we do with it? Then we use a, a Python, uh, Python package, uh, uh, SciPy. It provided the, the stats analysis tools that we can get the, the mean, we can get the variance. And we can try to, and we can use the priority function to do a, uh, the curve fitting that will speed out what would the, be the uh, best curve describe um, the data we collected and denotes the uh, blue line. And then we use the number uh, feed into a, a random number generation uh, by NumPy. And then we have a series of ge uh, generated data, uh, which is denoted in the, the red curve. So here I'm showing is that by just using uh, one pair of the uh, mean and variance, we can get a pretty decent uh, coverage of the, uh, the data um, uh, from native machine. And again, uh, the, right now, this is only happening in Python. It's just um, uh, to making sure uh, uh, that the mean and the variance we're getting are close enough. If we switch to the second application that I showed earlier, again, using dense, uh, power density function that uh, the shore, then you will kind of, uh, and then if we apply the same method, just uh, feeding to the, the Python for one iteration, we have a, um, we have a, a curve like this. Uh, doesn't look very good because even by human eyes, you can tell, oh, we have three different, um, local distribution, why do you just use one? And of course, it's easier to extend if we, um, so naturally, we, uh, we uh, crop the data into, um, into multiple regions and try to use more than one distribution to describe, to, um, describe the data uh, we collected. So here in this case, two is not enough, and I know we uh, settle down with using three, dis uh, uh, three distribution covering the, the spikes and then the middle here. And then we have a, a smaller distribution here. We also want it to be um, covered by um, our parameters. So here, um, using, one, uh, using one distribution is not enough for 
some applications, and then uh, hopefully during this, um, it makes sense that the application that um, we're using one, for example, the one I, I show on the top. So uh, yeah, sorry, step back here. This is all the eight application for the, from the tail bench uh, paper that we're trying to study uh, in the tail wag. The silo is the one I showed earlier using a uh, single, uh, single distribution and then shore is the one using three distribution on the second row. Um, and then uh, similarly spec, uh, uh, the applications on the top, for example, mastery and image DNA using mostly one distribution will be covering uh, most of the data points. And then uh, uh, the one on the bottom, uh, for example, it's IP and uh, bottom left that you will want a wider um, uh, distribution uh, coverage. And then for Moses, we have uh, three of them, but they're cl closer to each other. The Sphinx will be one wider uh, distribution coverage. Um, now, remember, one of the goal is to understand how do we have uh, better throughput or better latency. And then there are more than just uh, one uh, single threat performance. Um, when we're scaling up, um, so now we have uh, now we have uh, three application picked, and then we're trying to see uh, how does the performance behave when we have multiple threads. Um, image DNA and silo and Moses. Image DNA is uh, uh, image recognition, and the silo is the one I showed earlier. That's the uh, 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 sorry, in memory um, in memory database and the and the Moses uh, set uh, machine uh, translation system. So here uh, in the figure, uh, again, from uh, the x-axis are the load, um, the system load from low to high, and then uh, three different colors means, um, uh, here means uh, using one thread, using two threads, or using four threads. Um, application for, um, application uh, image DNN are scaling uh, better than, better than linear when I have uh, more than one thread. That's because uh, for this uh, kind of application, when you have multiple threads, they can actually encounter the, the rare spikes. And then, because um, client doesn't really send the, it's, it doesn't send the request consistently. And then using more thread can, uh, will be better handling those kind of cases. Uh, for the application in the middle of silo, we have worse than, lean, uh, worse than linear scaling. And it's due to the critical section related to the TCP stack when, you, when we're receiving and sending out requests. The third application I'm showing here also has um, a, a scalability, scalability problem, but due to different reasons. In the most, it's actually um, it's coming from the, the memory bottleneck, which is uh, reported in the original paper too. So here, um, I'm, what I'm showing here, uh, what I'm showing, sorry, the goal here is to, to say, now we understand, uh, to, to uh, explore the threat scaling, we need a second uh, parameter that is describing uh, the critical section. Now, uh, similar to the, the previous one, it's related to uh, the, uh, the network configuration where you have a net network of activities relating to uh, running the server client workload um, here. What I'm showing here is 95% tail, but the, the comparison I made between uh, having, um, having the, the interrupt running on the same, uh, same core servers or not, uh, that, uh, denoting as a mix or SAM. Um, for some application, you will have a bigger gap between, the, uh, between them, um, so I'm showing on the left. And then for some application, it does not, uh, it's uh, uh, almost the same. The, the reasoning is behind, uh, the reasoning is coming from uh, the, the first uh, parameter, which is the service, uh, service distribution. For silo, we will have a, a very narrow distribution and then the, the time at uh, the, the average latency is much, much smaller. And then for that IPM where I already have a wider distribution and it's, sorry, excuse me. But this kind of application is more uh, robust to 
uh, to system uh, to system timing disturbance. By doing this, we introduced uh, the third uh, parameter, which is the timing disturbance. It could be, in this case, it's coming from the, uh, the Ethernet behavior, and it could be also be the real-time scheduler, uh, the issue I mentioned earlier. Now I have uh, covered um, how, do we, how do we use um, this setup to analyze uh, different workloads and get um, a, uh, intuitions on how why does the system or why does the application behaves different and then try to extract the the timing behavior and then using the timing behavior we can do a uh, workload generation and then of course i'm going to validate it against uh, the real data so um now I, I covered how we how we get the information from the three parameters then we can um uh, assemble them into uh, a generate uh, assemble them into our um, workload, which is um, using uh, less than thirty lines of code. Um, as what uh, as I'm showing on the right, um, I just re um, refresh our memory. We have I talk about the three different uh, kind three three different sets of um, uh, parameters that within each of loop uh, the C plus plus loop will go through uh, representing one query. Then uh, we will have the service, uh, the main service time distribution. Um, since we're having different, it could be uh, uh, falling into different distribution. This uh, depends on the po possibility. And then we will have a critical section um, uh, before and after uh, representing when you're sending requests and then receiving a request. And then you can, you can also have any time and disturbance um, within, uh, for the system. So uh, 30 lines of code uh, doesn't really seem like a lot. And then it's really um, hard to believe that we can just use these to represent many lines of code, um, uh, the real time, uh, the, the real world system applications. So here, um, the, the first validation we're doing is against a single threaded, um, a single -threaded um, application for a single threaded setup for all the application. Uh, Similarly, I'm using uh, the same coloring, meaning uh, the green green lines are the mean latency, uh, the blue lines are blue curves are the 95 percentile, red curves are 99 percentile, and then the the comparison we're making is the solid lines, which are uh, uh, native machine experiments and uh, what we collected, and then dotted data are the data are using the parameters generated, and then uh, sorry, using the workload generated and the, what will be the performance looks like. Um, as you can see, most of, the, uh, most of the application, the solid lines are the, the dotted lines are overlapping with each other, which means that we do a pretty good job, except from spec JBB. Uh, the reasoning uh, being there are some uh, background uh, activities uh, with uh, uh, Java JBB and that we are not captured very well for the, the uh, but from tailwag. So yeah, we can use a set of just the, so here, this is a single threads only in the main distribution. We can mimic the latency and throughput performance. Um, um, then we move on to the next two, uh, the next two parameters uh, I introduced, the first one being the critical section. Similarly, I do the, the thread scaling um, curve fitting to see how do we uh, comparison, see how are we getting closer uh, between the the tail bench and tail wag. So here I'm showcase uh, I'm showcasing that. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, there's a type typo on the no figure. So the first one should be image DNN, which and the second one should be silo, which are um, which is uh, which are expected uh, once we edit in the critical section, denoting the TCP stack um, behavior. The third one is for the Moses. Uh, uh, included for comparison, uh, showing the ability, if we have a system without memory bottleneck, the dotted lines are showing you the optimal performance that, uh, that's if you have enough memory. Yes. And then, oh, 
And then for the for the timing disturbance, uh, which means uh, the Ethernet um, behavior, I collected a similar set of data that for Silo and Zipian, we have a, a clo um, close um, uh, prediction on how the system behaves. And then for Moses, again, I'm showing the ability um, without without the, uh, the memory bottleneck. And so we can accumulate, uh, so we can use um, a different set of parameters accumulatively um, as, as we want. So now I have a cover, how do we get the workload? Uh, how do we generate the workload? And I did a uh, first order validation against the, the, the real uh, tail bench generated data. But now, but what can we do with uh, uh, the tail wag is uh, one make it more interesting. We want to explore some of the configurations or system that we don't have. For instance, uh, we don't have a TPU, but we but I do have the application running uh, image DNN, uh, running image media, Im sorry, image DNN uh, using DNN algorithm. So here we can the, for the DNN algorithm we can um, go uh, go to different ways. We can have a more complicated algorithm, which means more work need to be done if the system, if the hardware is the same. Or we can have the same software application, but has a better system uh, using a Google TPU that can, can have a, uh, a crazy speed up. Now, what do we what do we uh, what we change in the in the generator workload is by changing only the service time need to be changed. The baseline we have the the uh, fitted data is uh, 400, um, 400 milliseconds. For the bigger model, we just in, in, uh, multiply that by 1.46. Uh, and then for the next two using hardware, uh, now using TPU, we can, uh, which means reducing the, uh, the mean latency, which will give, you, uh, give us a curve, uh, uh, predicted curve um, like this, where, uh, where we, we do, uh, but the interesting, yeah, the interesting thing here is that uh, even though we have a seventy percent uh, improvement on the uh, on the latency, it doesn't actually mean you can have um, a seventy time a better throughput because uh, that's the the red dotted line here uh, showing the figure. Because when you go into um, those kind of uh, this region of performance, uh, the system behavior, um, the background behavior, such as the uh, the interrupt handling, the thread, uh, the thread, the shared resources, and then the um, those uh, those factor beside behind main distribution will come to play, and then limiting how much you can prove. Which means for those kind of system, you don't really want to just blindly applying a GPU and hope you have 70, 70 time uh, seventy time better performance. Then. Um, Right, yeah, so this allows us to uh, have a um, design space of exploration. And then for some of this, uh, for the system that, so now moving to, I have a real system, I have the application, but I just want to uh, see what kind of different uh, runtime configuration that can apply to the, uh, to the app I'm running. Here is the Java application, uh, it's one application, uh, it's called SpecJVB using, uh, using JVM. And then garbage collector is one of the, uh, they have very common background threads that uh, collecting unused um, memory of uh, handling memory fragmentation. And then uh, traditionally there are, uh, I just, uh, I'm just picking some of the garbage collector for comparison, a uh, uh, parallel garbage collector being one of the traditional one uh, where we have to stop uh, all the Java threads and then using, using parallel, uh, using multiple threads doing parallel work to reduce the time uh, the stop of the world event. And then the ZGC is a more modern garbage collector claiming to have a better uh, pausing time, but it was, uh, since it's running uh, all the time, it will slow down the, the average, um, the mean latency of the application. So, so, here what, so here what we explore, what we're comparing is for PLGC, we have a timing disturbance that's uh, 15 milliseconds happening every 10 seconds representing we have around uh, like uh, four to eight uh, gig uh, gigabyte uh, RAMs. And then for the ZGC, we have 10% uh, more on the service time distribution. But comparing that, we can, uh, we can, um, we can identify uh, 
we can identify where are the sweet spots where you you want a better latency. Um, that's um that's uh, to the bottom, or you want a better throughput using a PLGC to the right. And then lastly, uh, we'll be talking about uh, the, the Ethernet interrupt handling that uh, motivates some of our exploration is, uh, what if I, uh, the hardware accelerator for interrupt handling is not, is, is what we don't have, but how do we, how do we, sure, uh, how do we know how much performance we're getting? So here, similarly, you have the SEP and mix case where we have uh, uh, the interrupt running on the same core or not. That. And then uh, for, for our mix case, um, we are we are using uh, four, uh, ev four mi uh, microsecond on average for all the requests, uh, denoting the performance um, slowdown running uh, using the running interrupt in the same core. And then we have a, uh, a predicted uh, hardware XR case where if we reduce the time by um, by eighty percent, now we only have uh, sorry, not eighty percent, but reduce down to uh, zero point five uh, microsecond. What be what be the performance looks like? Uh, it's in the it's in the so in the green dot lines here showing the figure, and then of course uh, it's not it's not realistic. But the optimal case, if we reduce the, all the timing disturbance, we can achieve the the Rymos blue curve. So this will be the hardware case that uh, doesn't exist, um, but it's worth the interest. Now it makes sense there was the interest to invest it. So um, now finished. Uh, now finishing up, I want to uh, conclude our conclude our work here. Hopefully uh, during this talk, I've been covered um, what are the challenges and then the the metrics or the server workloads are being latency and both latency and throughput, both of them are important. And then trying to balance them are, uh, are difficult. And using TLWAG, we can have a, a easy and fast repeatable uh, analyze and generation of workflow that's uh, using less than 30 lines of code. And then we did validate against a, a real workload and then we can repeat the behavior and it's not, the analysis is not rely on the hardware system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, applause was here from the from the audience. Um, is there any question from the audience? Oh, there's one question. No, that that micro doesn't work. work. He can't hear you from that one. Hi. Uh, so, so I have one one question. So you mentioned, uh, you know, doing this sort of interrupt handling. Uh, I think on page or slide eight. Um, I was just kind of yeah. curious. Like, so have you also considered uh, the Sorry, polling approach? Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. That's that's the one. Yeah, pay, uh, okay. page eight or the previous one where you're showing the, oh, the uh, previous one. Oh, okay. Yeah, the one that you just had. Yeah, this one. Yes. So yes. I know for um for data plane like data plane processing mm -hmm. like yes. Intel has this library, uh, right. DPDK, yeah, DPDK, right? DPDK, so yes. they use a polling approach, right? That. That's also similar, like they pin it to one core to handle the, the Ethernet like uh, coming in. But the idea is like you don't get that overhead from, you know, running the uh, the interrupt uh, service routine. Right. Yes. When exactly. the Ethernet packet comes in. So I was wondering if, if you have like numbers on the on the polling approach. Oh, we don't have the numbers on the uh, that specific method, but why can I uh, kind of um, uh, that will be actually similar to. Uh, what I'm showing here, the the SAP, SAP case, yes, the SAP case still uh, having the the interrupt handling, but those are, are dedicated core. So dedicated core is a pro is the the main issue we're trying to avoid. We don't want to. What if I don't? Uh, uh, we don't want to sacrifice hardware resources. We want to use all the cores. That's why um, there's a trade off. So yes, even using DBDK. Will the polling method will give you a better performance on some of them, but the penalties are still the hardware resources. Okay, I see. Yeah, uh, thanks. does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Yeah.